All right, terrific. So then to, to segue, and thanks again for uh, having me. Again, uh, Hari, what a, it's a fantastic conference. I was, uh, like I said before, lucky enough to be here three years ago, and uh, it's amazing to see the changes and just how big this conference has become. Um, so I am going to talk about uh, lung vision in particular, but, but I think the theme, uh, as Mike just highlighted as well, we can talk about all the different technologies, but the need for external imaging to confirm where your tool is, whether that's a thin scope, a catheter-based system, or something robotic, the data and the experience of the users will tell you that external validation is important. And honestly, you know this even from just taking a so-called blind transbronchial biopsy. It is typically done with the, some amount of fluoroscopic guidance to at least confirm you're in the general area you want it to be. The limit to fluoroscopy has always been, of course, the inability to see the lesions. So where advanced interoperative imaging comes in, where lung vision comes in, is the ability to take that C-arm data and do something more valuable with it. So these are my conflicts, not that that matters. So the challenges with the virtual navigations is that all of the various platforms that are talked about really are virtual. You're going after some ball, but the ball moves because the lung moves and the heart moves and there's atelectasis. This is Joe Sasania's slides, so let me give him credit. Um, we have CT to body divergence across all platforms. We have it even if you've just been studying the CT and how much a lesion in its relationship to the airways weight may move because of atelectasis and bleeding. There's ultimately failure of all of our tools and an inability to get good samples. Because everything that we're trying to do is based off a CT scan that was done with a patient, wide awake, taking a full breath, usually with their hands above their head, and now their hands are to their side, they're sedated, they're paralyzed, they're under anesthesia, they are not remotely in the same position. So we've got to try to improve our yields. As Mike just highlighted, the yields have been good, but you'll notice from his talk, no matter what technology platform, when external imaging was added, yields went up. And Mike and Chris and others have done a lot of great work showing just how much CT to body diversion matters. If you just look here, I can't really, it's sort of seeing my laser pointer. The degree of overlap is quite poor. And look, if you're biopsying something three to four centimeters, no one cares. But if you're biopsying a one centimeter lesion and you have that much divergence, then if you're biopsying the red ball, but the blue ball is where the circ, where the target is. Anyway, sorry. These, these bozos in the front made a face. So, why does it occur? We've already talked about it some. Um, there's a really great online lecture that, uh, for the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy that Dr. Bodger gave uh, that really highlights the, the pitfalls of CT to body divergence. And atelectasis and tissue distortion and hemorrhage are one of the biggest causes. And you know, we always said, well, then the radial probe, that's, that's real time, right? I mean, you see a lesion. How more real time can radi it be than radial probe? But you've got one, it's only lateral looking, even on Mike's really great video, he kind of got a hint of it because of course he was biopsying a lesion that was dead ahead and it doesn't look dead ahead. And there's lots of other things that look like lung lesions. So you can biopsy that, but it's gonna be atelectasis. You can biopsy that, but it's gonna be hemorrhage. Seeing a rebus sign doesn't automatically mean you're in the lesion. So that whole problem of virtual target versus actual target cuts across all platforms. And it's massive, and it's worse in the lower lobes. The non-upper lobe area is 18 millimeters on average. That is a significant degree of divergence depending on the lesion size you're biopsying. So for example, this is a case that we did. We had moved ourselves directly in front of the yellow ball. We're ready to take our biopsies. But then we had used lung vision and updated where the lesion actually was. So then I moved to face the lesion under fluoro. And notice on the Monarch, now my catheter's here. I'm nowhere near where Monarch thought the lesion was, but I have a nice radial probe signal. And of course we had a diagnostic biopsy. Same with the shape sensing systems. This is not one system better than the other. The, they all suffer from CT to body divergence. And you still get significant uh, CT to body divergence, in this case two centimeters away from what the ion had thought you were at. That's gonna be the difference between a diagnostic and a non-diagnostic case. And in particular, 
depending on where the lesion is located, that's going to be the difference between a massive complication when you biopsy a large vascular structure um, as opposed to sampling the actual lesion. And I think it's important of just how much there was and how unpredictable it is. This is also a nice paper that Pritchett put out talking about that the nodule's center has moved and that there's not a predictability to it. So real-time guidance is needed, and it's critical for this high diagnostic yield. And a lot's been talked about, um, you know, cone beam and so forth. Let's start from the beginning. Needle biopsy has always been, at least from a yield perspective, superior to bronchoscopy because they use real-time guidance. Sure, they have lots of complications, and sure, they don't stage the patient in the same procedure, so it's clearly an inferior procedure, but if I'm just talking yields, the ability to watch my needle go into the lesion and know the lesion is there is unbelievably valuable. If you need, you know, sort of the, uh, I'll run with the analogy, but why is mediastinal EBIS so successful? You have real-time confirmation of where your target is and, of course, real-time view of the needle going in. Now, we're working on getting to the stage of being able to see a needle go directly into the lesion intraoperatively in the periphery, but I've got to at least know where the lesion is. The problem, of course, with cone beam solutions is the price. They're a, it's a barrier. But every Bronx suite typically has access to a C-arm, whether it's in your suite or it's in the hospital and it rolls in for when you have cases. And so if you could take that C-arm and do something more valuable with it, you could add intraprocedural imaging that will provide guidance with a small footprint. There's a board that lays under the patient, but apparently I've been told in the next version that's going away. And then the box, which can be anywhere in the room, and then a wireless-based tablet that controls the whole thing. So in an era where our machines keep getting bigger and bigger, taking up more and more of our space, this doesn't actually take up much of a footprint. And the idea behind it is to give you this intraoperative imaging using any conventional C-arm so that you can get a tomosynthesis view of your catheter and then your tool inside the lesion with your reference pre-op CT to give you confirmation that you're where you wanted to be in multiple different planes. So it takes that pre-op CT and the nodules in whatever location every other technology thinks it is, but then during the case, you update the lesion location because you do TOMO and you can see the lesion and you can even confirm that your instrumentation is in the lesion. And all of this with a C-arm and a C-arm spin that takes about 20 seconds to do the spin and just under a minute to do the processing. And so just to compare, using a GE9900, this is the TOMO view. You can see your lesion. But this is what it looks like under cone beam. And this is what it looks like with one of the mobile uh, cone beam systems, the SIO spin, versus using, again, the GE9900. Now, this is actually body vision using SIOs, but versus just the blind, the blind SIOs vision you get. It really, in the end, comes down to, can I believe the image? The virtual image, no, you can't believe it. It has moved. But when you do an intraop tomo, you now can see exactly where the lesion is. And so what does that translate to? That translates to, then, during the case, an overlay on the fluoro screen of where the lesion actually is. And so in this particular case, it's a bronchoscope pushing lung vision's catheter out into the lesion. They have a catheter if you want, but this could, you could take this picture and substitute in a thin scope. You could substitute in any robotic scope. It doesn't matter. And it does it this way because you can see it in multiple planes that your instrumentation is in it. And then you get this additional, arguably, probably not needed during the case, but it does make cool video. You get this nice swinging 3D view that you can definitively see that you're in it. And again, this is from a C-arm, the standard C-arm that's been in my Bronx suite for the last 10 years. This is how we're doing this, because of course it's the power of the underlying software. It takes my C-arm data and does something very valuable with it. And then while you're taking your biopsies, again, you can now, in this particular image, you can see the lesion is actually fluoroscopically visible. There's a gray ball behind it. But many times, of course, it's not. This yellow ball, though, is the lesion. You marked it. So as you pass whatever instrumentation into it, 
you know you're there. And all you also have to do, you say, well, how do I know I'm, I'm not anterior or posterior? Rotate your C-arm 45 degrees one way, take a shot, rotate it 45 the other way, take a shot, and see across two orthogonal planes that you are still inside the lesion, you're inside the lesion. Taking a straw poll of many different endoscopists, I've asked, you know, if you have no confidence of where you really are, that you've been CT to body divergence, you haven't had a good radial signal, you know, you, you think you're at the lesion, but you're not confident. How, how aggressive are your biopsies? And generally speaking, everyone has agreed with me that it's, we're definitely a little softer in our approach because we're not confident we're even gonna get an answer and we're pretty confident that we're gonna cause a complication. And the worst complication is no diagnosis. But when you know where you are, you're definitely a lot more aggressive, if you will, about your taking a biopsy. If you're, you know, been mentally worried about doing cryobiopsies in the periphery, if you have the confidence you're there, I think your concern factor might go down a little bit and your success factor will clearly go up. In fact, here's the data about how much your success factor will go up. Using just a bronchoscope and their catheter, the yield's 88%. And then when Mike and Mike talked about earlier, our, our data combining it with the Monarch, we've achieved a 91% yield. And again, it's all about adding external imaging. I think what's also important, new technologies and us as bronchoscopists looking at fluoro in a different way, so it's new. What's my learning curve? So this was a nice interim ongoing study um, out of San Diego, uh, George Chang and his partners looking at it and across the two physicians anywhere from eight to 12 cases where they essentially started to get themselves uh, completely comfortable with the whole process. So there's a minor learning curve, but it's not extensive. Now let's do a case. This um, is the catheter itself, catheter-based. This is the planning software, which I'll, I'll cycle through the video because it, takes, it gets long. But you essentially outline the lesion, it fills it in, right? And then you're able to um, segment the whole airway, and then you see the airway segmenting. You build your path, and then you register. You do a registration around the main carina, and then as you get out towards the lesion, you can do another registration. You have an update where the lesion is. You see it across multiple planes. And then you get an overlay, and they're pushing the catheter out, getting near it. And then what you'll see, they do their first tool and lesion spin. And you'll notice it seems to be a little off when you start to see where the catheter comes in. So when we mark the lesion, we get the 3D view. This right here is about to be a non-diagnostic bronchoscopy. Now you saw that already on the fluoro overlay. So they're able to make adjustments, and they made adjustments to the catheter and its alignment with the lesion to where now they've got themselves a nice center strike. And then they can take their biopsies. Now, this is a nice case from Mike using ion and lung vision. So again, this is the nodule he wants to get to, and you saw his case of navigating uh, with, with that device. So here is the ion scope, and just, this is the lung vision overlay. For point of comparison, this is what the cone beam overlay was. This was actually a study that he was using cone beam as the ultimate standard of, you know, is the tomo synthesis accurate? And there's a, it's, they're beautiful images, but they're also, of course, we'll notice the definitive similarities. And then, similarly, as Mike's taking his biopsies, he's able to have confirmation that his needle is exactly where it should be, because that is a confirmed in real time that you know, about 30 seconds before he did his biopsies, where the lesion is located. And then this is similar, our case, um, the Monarch and, and uh, using lung vision together. This was the, the lesion we were going after. Let me fast forward it up here. When we do, um, that's the planning. And then when we're doing the tomo spin, we're getting out near the lesion, we want to update the lesion's location. You can still see it, even these small, almost cystic-like lesions, using just a standard GEC arm, and I'm sure it would work with any of the other competitor C arms. Um, you can update the lesion location. 
And what that allows you to do then is while you're taking your biopsies, know that that little circle is exactly the lesion you want to biopsy. No matter what the virtual representation was telling you. And the thing that's interesting is that when you turn on the updated lesion is how much this yellow ball moves. That it was originally over here and then it slides over. And especially as a small lesion like this, this is the difference between a successful case and an unsuccessful case. This ended up being metastatic head neck cancer. And again, you get these three-dimensional views that are really cool looking. This is as we were putting a catheter near it. So with that, my sign over here says time's up. And so I'm on my last slide. Thank you so much for your kind attention. If you find yourself in the Chicago area, come say hi. Thank you, sir.